they never believe that I'm Isangom. I don't know. I don't have the beads around me. I don't have those type of things because I'm not interested in playing into your stereotypical idea of what a Sangoma should be and what they should look like. This is Buche Beswe Simoni. She's a South African artist who's made a name for herself in her country and internationally through her sculptures, multimedia, and performance art. Like many artists, her personal life heavily influences her work. Unlike many artists, however, she's also a practicing Sangoma. In Southern Africa, a Sangoma is a traditional healer or diviner who's seen as a bridge between the living and their ancestors. I talked with Sewani to learn more about how a millennial Sangoma balances tradition and modernity. I had a million questions, like, how did she know she was a Sangoma? So, you basically get a calling, and everybody's calling is different. I suppose mine had to do with dreams and intuition, so uh, I would get into like really weird predicaments and I would go back to one question, which was, um, can I go see a person? And that happened to be Sangoma. And at my house, there wasn't anything like that. We had never done any of that. Eventually, Sewani decided to pursue the calling and become a trainee, or Tuasa, under an experienced Sangoma. My mentor was 83. He was old, so he was hella old school, and he wasn't about to play games with any of us. Training looks different for different types of people and for the different places that you go to train because you need to train at a place where um, you can foster the type of abilities that you have because different people have different types of abilities. They have different types of ancestors. There's not just like one type of ancestor who does one thing. It is a difficult process. Uh, any process where you're not with any of your family members, I think is a difficult process. Um, anywhere where things are unfamiliar and where you're constantly learning and not knowing when you're going to go home, I think is difficult for anybody. What are some of the hardest lessons that you had to learn during that time? Patience, which I still haven't learned. In older times, you know, people would have put out flags, white flags, or there'd be a marker, or people would just work word of mouth. And I use, I don't use the white flag at my house. Um, I just do a word of mouth. If you know and you want to consult, you can, you just call me. You have to find my number, you have to find me. With the westernization of the world and with like LSMs and also with just thinking that uh, being pure, clean and whatever is closer, whiteness is closer to that. People don't want to go to Izangoma because they're like, oh, we're going back to the dark ages, we're going back to this, this and that, you know, because we've been portrayed as barbaric. So what are the misconceptions that people have of being a Sangoma? Sangomas don't believe in maybe... Uh, a god, church, you know. Actually, there's churches for Izangoma. One of the misconceptions is that we're dirty. We're actually really clean. The materials that we use are associated with being dirty because they're like animal byproducts. Or but another common one is that, you know, it's dark, it's mysterious. Colonization undoubtedly had a lot to do with the maligning of Sangomas, but it was unable to get rid of them completely. I'm really impressed that Sangomas are, are still kind of like a force in modern South African culture. So how do you think that it was able to kind of survive colonialization? When you have people in the rural areas and they're not really going in there, this is still going to continue in rural areas. It's going to manifest itself there. During apartheid, the South African government forcibly removed black South Africans from cities and confined them to rural areas called Bantu stands under the Group Areas Act. This forced ethnic separation was a common tactic of colonial governments. For example, parallels can be seen in the U.S. with forced relocation of indigenous people to reservations. By the way, even though the Group Areas Act is no longer, forced removals of brown and black people still happen in one form or another in South Africa. Areas like Woodstock and Marikana and Philippi East around the Cape Town area are two present-day examples. 
There's a documentary called Noma that explains more about Marikana if you're interested. Bantustans were considered separate from the country of South Africa, which was exclusively for white people. Until 1986, black people had to have what was basically a passport to leave their Bantustan and to cross the border into South Africa, which they could only really do to work in mines, farms, or in service positions for white South Africans. Because of these government policies, black people and white people essentially lived in two different worlds. Okay, so I now understand how Sangomas were able to survive in present-day South Africa, but on a personal level, is it tough to be something so traditional and earn a living by making conceptual art? Are there conflicts? I think they're all very, they have to do with the physical self and the personal self. Physical, material me wants this, but spiritual me cannot allow that to happen. Physical me has dreams and aspirations. Uh, spiritual me has other things in place. And I'm the type of person who likes to plan and who likes things to happen in a particular way. And the fact that because of the spiritual being that I am, I have to just understand that life doesn't happen the way that you want it to happen. Is that. One question I love to ask is, what would you tell a stranger coming into South Africa? People have like these weird ideas about South Africa. They must just leave those ideas at home. <laughs> yeah, they must leave those ideas at home because they're going to be in for a shock. Things are probably the same as they are wherever the hell you're from too. But it's just that it's much more beautiful here. <laughs> <laughs>